Nancy, you and I may not have a lot in common uh, superficially, but down deep, we both have this lifelong passion for the relationship between science and, and theology. We're here at this conference, the quest for consonance in, in uh, theology and the natural sciences. I see here that realism in science and realism in theology is one of the themes here. Uh, that seems a little strange to me. Why is realism a theme at this conference seeking consonance? I think it's a, a slightly outdated question in philosophy of science. <laughs> and um, I'd like to start by saying that uh, one of the criticisms of uh, philosophical thought in the modern period is that it has diverged so radically from the ordinary way we use language. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to the ordinary person on the street, um, he or she would say, well, of course the real world exists. And the interesting questions are, what is there and how do you explain it? And the realism question actually puts that backwards. It takes theories and uh, other uh, uh, data and so forth written on paper and then asks the backward question, is there anything out there that it refers to? Well, the, the argument is, is that there are many optical illusions. We only have the ability to sense the world through our senses. Uh, everything is mediated by our senses and then by the midbrain and then the thalamus and then the cortex. I mean, it goes through a lot of processing before, you know, we're, are we in touch with the thing in itself? I mean, yes. these arguments go way back. I understand that. But there's some legitimacy to that. I mean, how, how do I really know what I know? Well, I think that was a period in philosophy <laughs> that has uh, come to its end amongst the um, uh, more critical thinkers, and I don't mean critical in the sense yeah. of critical realist. The major origin of it was the beginning of modern philosophy with uh, René Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, but with his Catholic educational background, he had the Augustinian idea that the way one knows is one tries to enter into one's mind or soul and contemplate mm -hmm. what's in there. Mm -hmm. And that's where you've got your sense memory stored up. That's where you've got your knowledge of mathematics and so forth. And then in the spiritual tradition, uh, Catholic and others, uh, one of the purposes of entering into oneself is to um, meet God. Mm -hmm. And for Augustine, Entering into your own mind or soul was something that uh, you could do voluntarily, but you weren't trapped in there. But when Descartes came along, he also had the notion that uh, knowledge begins with the ideas in the mind, and then the problem that has bedeviled modern philosophy for 300 years is how can we ever know that the ideas in our mind sure. represent what uh, accurately what's out there or whether they represent anything at all. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I'm happy that I didn't end up teaching undergraduate philosophy is you've got, first of all, to um, uh, propagandize <laughs> your freshman students uh, to get them to have Away that, for, yeah. <laughs> to, get, to get them to have that um, skeptical uh worry about their own perceptions. And then we'd have to bring them back. You'd have to go... Yeah, and then, and bring yeah them you back. have to make them take a whole right, philosophy So, so, so to get into this a little deeper, let's define, though, what the opposite is. So if we're talking about realism in science or realism in theology, what, what, what is the opposite? What is the alternative in each case? What does anti-realism mean in science and anti-realism would mean in theology? Well, there have been different opponents to realism. If you go back to the logical positivists in the 1920s, they were uh, reacting hugely against uh, Hegelian idealism. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was the position, of course, that uh, all reality is in some sense mind dependent. Mm -hmm. And what they were trying to argue is that uh, there is an objective world and we can have objective knowledge of it. In fact, that's the only knowledge we could have. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. But then you get to the neo-positivists uh, who were more enlightened, I would say, <laughs> about our ability to actually know data about mm -hmm. the world around us. But you get different theories then about how you can cons 
confirm uh, scientific theory. And uh, you've got Carl Hempel who says it's hypothetical deductive reasoning. We have observations. We creatively form a hypothesis, but when, then we test it with further observations. But he was heavily overshadowed by Karl Popper, who uh, emphasized falsificationism. And uh, to put his position much too briefly, he said that the in any uh, area, uh, the theory that should be chosen is the one that is the most most falsifiable and not yet falsified. Mm -hmm. And so that raised the question that in philosophy of science we call the question of verisimilitude. If you're going from one non-falsified theory to another non-falsified theory, can you make any sense of the idea that this is a progression toward some kind of truth? Mm -hmm. And then Thomas Kuhn came along, who was um, bete noir for mm -hmm. Popper, and he talked about uh, competing and incommensurable paradigms, incommensurable paradigms. Um, and uh, I believe some people have even claimed that uh, Einsteinian physics is actually closer to Aristotelian than it is to Newtonian. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so that exacerbated the problem of verisimilitude to the point that uh, the concept of truth actually just dropped out of philosophy of science during the years that I was studying it. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and so let's understand what anti-realism, I, I understand that in science, and, and a, a radical empiricist would say we can, we can basically know the data, but we can never know what's in the black box that generated it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's uh, clear. But in, in theology, what is an, an anti-realist? Well, I first got interested in the realism issue because I was reading uh, people like Ian Barber and yeah. Arthur Peacock who uh, promoted the notion that uh, critical realism was a good way of understanding the status of scientific yeah. theories, but it was also a good way of understanding the status of theological theories. And, and so uh, they but they were saying that critical realism was good for the, theology, but what were they? What, what was the alternative to that that they were opposing, or well, that they were saying this is an improvement of? At first, uh, you could just say that they're recognizing the fallibilism of theology, but what Arthur Peacock was arguing against uh, was uh, the consequences of the movement called the Strong Program in the Sociology of Science. And uh, this was the idea that you really needed to look at the uh, sociological context, context yeah, uh, that, in order to understand why certain theoretical judgments yeah. were made the way they were. That makes scientists really mad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, and but, then, but if you apply that to theologians... Well, uh, it's, it's an even worse problem with theology because uh, what happened... Uh, around the beginning of, uh, around the year 1900, let's say, is uh, that modern liberal theology took a radical anthropocentric turn, and the claim was that theological statements are not statements about, directly at least, not directly statements about God, about God creating the world and so forth, it's really an expression of human religious awareness. Oh, that's a huge difference. Yes. And yeah. so um, that led to people who called themselves theological non-realists. <laughs> and I remember being at a conference one time and saying, why don't you just come right out and say it? <laughs> Theological non-realism is just a fancy word for atheism. Yeah, right. right. And so now, if, if, you, if you would sum up uh, the, the importance of realism in the science-theology dialogue, um, I, th I think you would say this is an interesting subject, but maybe it's, very, it's not really dispositive. It's maybe something that is more important in the past than it is today. Well, it's... Uh, taken on a new importance today because of the uh, talk about uh, the social construction of knowledges and even pluralizing mm. knowledges mm. gives you mm. a very relativistic mm. picture. And so uh, uh, there would be claims that uh, theological 
uh, systems are socially constructed, and you can kind of get grounds from that for that by looking at uh, the different religions that have cropped up in different cultures. But then uh, more radical claims go on to say that science is all socially constructed as well. But, but it's easier an argument to make for religion than for science. It is. <laughs> it is.